Okay, and can you mm -hmm. see my slides? Yes. Awesome. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt and I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. I'd like to welcome you to this roundtable, Institutional Repositories Roundtable. Um, our facilitator today will be Julie Morris from UNB, who and she is also the uh, chair of our Scholarly Communications Committee here at CALL. Um, to start, I just want a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we are recording, uh, so I just want to get let folks know that. Uh, we. Uh, I'm also asking that if you are not uh, asking a question or whatever, that you uh, keep yourself muted during the presentation, or not the presentation, but uh, when you're not speaking. And then also, if possible, if you're not speaking, to uh, turn off your video just to help those of uh, our members who might be coming from low bandwidth areas. Um, but otherwise, I will turn the session over to, uh, oh yes, and just at FYI, the recording will be posted on the call website and the YouTube channel uh, shortly after we're finished. And without further ado, I will pass things over to Julie. Julie. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, so I'd like to begin uh, today by making a territorial acknowledgement. Uh, so CAL CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of uh, Nunatsiagut and Nunatukatput, the Inuit of Nitasinin, the Beotuk and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. In New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wolastikwik, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy people. We at CAL CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this uh, for this opportunity to discuss with our colleagues and learn from each other. I'm going to um, just present myself. My name is Julie Morris. I'm the Collections Analysis and Bibliometrics Librarian at the University of New Brunswick, as well as the Chair of the CAL um, Scholarly Communications Committee. And I'm joined today by Nicole Slip, who is the Scholarly, Scholarly Publications Librarian at Mount St. Vincent University, who will be moderating the chat. So the way this is going to work today is um, I actually have a poll everywhere. Um, poll everywhere uh, set up. So you'll see at the top of the presentation slides a link for pollev.com uh, slash Julie Morris 677. You can go to that link and I'm going to go through some questions uh, that will prompt discussion today. You can enter your responses on poll everywhere or you can if you feel more comfortable, you can pop them in the chat and please um, if you have some uh, something to share, please speak up and we'll um, uh, just raise your hand. I'll have maybe Nicole moderate the the. Um, the discussion and make sure that people I can't see <laughs> I can't see who's online so if you put your hands up maybe Nicole is it possible for you to just call on people and have them speak up yeah, no problem okay thank you so much so uh the first question that we're going to discuss today and feel free to put it in the poll everywhere or um or in the chat is what IR tools does your institution use and if anyone wants to share sort of their um, their their experience using any of these tools, looks like we have Island Dora, DSpace, Cairn. Um, if anyone wants to speak up and talk about their experience, I welcome people to join the chat now. No? Okay, so it looks like Islandora, DSpace, ePrints, um, or, or DSpace and Islandora are the two big ones. Do people enjoy using these platforms? Have they had success with them? 
if anyone wants to share their experiences. I know some people are doing migrations and things like that, so. Okay. In the chat, um, someone's saying that they're looking to replace ePrints right now. Looking to replace ePrints. Um, mm -hmm. Has anyone migrated from ePrints to another platform that wants to share their experience? No, maybe not. Okay. All right, well, um, it looks like everyone's done entering their uh, their responses. Uh, so D space and Island door number one. Some interesting stuff coming up in the chat, Julie. So some people are saying they don't like Islandora. Someone says they actually pay another company to manage Islandora for them, um, which is quite expensive. Um, does to the person who said in the chat, um, does that improve the experience having somebody else manage it uh, for you? Is it worth that that expense? They say yes. Um, and I know I, I can share at our institution, we just did a big upgrade to our DSpace um, from DSpace 4 to 7, so really big jump. Um, and it has not been without it, its problems in, in that process, um, but but 7 is, is okay so far. Um, definitely still working out, um, you know, being the latest version, there are some things that, that don't um, quite work smoothly yet, but... Hopefully we'll get there. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I think I'll move on to the next question. Um, does your region have an institutional repository strategy? So this question came up as a result of, um, I think someone put it in their uh, response when they signed up for this session. Um, so I don't know if there's, um, if anyone knows of a region that has an institutional repository strategy or uh, whether or not anyone's thinking about establishing one, that would be really interesting. Can you see, can you still see my slides when I toggle back to Teams? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so it looks like most people don't know if there's an institutional repository strategy. 40% uh, said no. Um, is this something that people might be interested in? Want to see a in national solution? Yeah. Yeah, and then in the chat, they seem to be very supportive of the national solution. Yes, I see that. Wow. Yes, yes, or national. Okay. Has anybody um, sort of engaged in any conversations uh, with their consortiums about establishing a regional IR strategy? Yes, for national. Okay, so I know um, that might be something that's in the works. Uh, I don't know if Jasmine is here. If Jasmine's here, maybe they can, I know that they had been thinking about this recently. Maybe they can speak up. Oh, I am here. Yes. Hi, Jasmine. Hi. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we did meet with Jeff Harder, who's been seconded to look at this. They're in very early stages um, right now, but a lot of us um, who are looking to move off of Islandora are really hoping that they can move quickly because we're all very interested, um, especially if it works similarly to Dataverse. I think a lot of us have had a really good experience with that, so we're really hoping to join the national initiative. So it sounds like there's a lot of interest in it. Um, I'm especially interested in hearing from folks who might be at smaller institutions. Uh, is this something that you would benefit from um, versus maybe if anyone's at a larger institution, if they're uh, if they have a different perspective? But it seems like everyone's really on board with the national initiative. Elizabeth. Hi, uh, I'm at Mount Allison University, which is a small university. I'm the data and digital services librarian, so I'm responsible for RDM um, and the institutional repository um, and other services on campus. Uh, 
having um, a national strategy would mean that we wouldn't need to be spending as much time on um, learning how well first of all we wouldn't have to go through an rfp process because it would be something that we could make an easy case for joining it um it would also mean that we would be involved in um collaborative decision making i think the model for uh research that we've seen through research data management for borealis has been very helpful for small institutions it's allowed us to focus on communication with faculty members and the delivery of service rather than um managing an it project so that's uh the main the main reason that we would be interested in a national project is that we've seen how well that worked for research data management and would like to see the same sort of um, setup for an institutional repository where we can be subscribers and also um, contributors to a project with monthly calls thank you that's really great insight we agree with Elizabeth. Yeah. So hopefully that's something that comes about. OK, so it seems like there's a lot of support for a, a national IR strategy. So that's um, that's fantastic. I'm glad that we um, that we've had this conversation. I'll move on to the next question and hopefully it'll generate a bit more discussion. Um, what is your IR promotion strategy or process? Do people want to speak about what they're doing at their institutions in terms of promoting their institutional repositories? Okay, so there's seems like there might be a gap in this area. Policy work for thesis yeah. deposits. Paul had her hand up. Okay, yeah. Paul Eva. Oops. Sorry, no, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I Sorry. didn't mean to. <laughs> okay. Um, so we don't have one yet yet to launch. Have yet to launch the repository. Uh, we put a number of hits in our annual report. We also use it for faculty publications. Not sure we have an official promotion strategy. Thesis have to go in others or by request by the researcher. We're currently not actively promoting it because it doesn't work. Um, so are people finding that they are having difficulty um, with uptake with their institutional repositories? Like what is the biggest challenge? Is it um, like communications with faculty and, and students? Um, employee policy helps with recruitment. We get all theses, no real official promotion strategy though. Just launch, we don't have a formal one yet. So it sounds like this is an area that people are sort of struggling with and trying to get established. Has anyone had any success with an institutional repository strategy? In the chat, Inba had mentioned that they promoted it, the IR with ORCID. Okay. During presentations as part of library programming, Use it for OA need for grant folks. Yeah. So meeting those tri agency requirements. Um, promoted IR with ORCID. Recruitment has happened with grant submissions. Yeah. Does anybody? Um, I'm just thinking. So, like at UNB, um, all of our grant proposals go through the Office of Research Services. Has anybody established um, like a relationship with their Office of Research Services to promote the institutional repository at the grant application um, at sort of the, the, the beginning stages of the grant application process or a sort of end of grant um, process? Has anyone done that? 
I think that would be really interesting, uh, at least for us. OK, we presented each grant application ses session hosted by the research office. That's great. I think I think Mike does as well here at UNB. So that's a really great strategy as well to make people aware that it needs to be part of the uh, the grant. If they're getting tri-agency grants, it needs to be part of that process. Try promoting with the Office of Research Services, but there's been little uptake. A lot of turnover in that office, so we're meeting with them soon to let them know all we can offer and how we can help. Okay, at CBU, I request a list of tri-agency funded folks and I reach out. Um, I'm guessing that is maybe Jasmine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> is that me. something you want to speak about? Um, I just started doing it after I went to the last webinar and Jessica Lang talked about doing that. I mm -hmm. think she's at U Montreal. And so I thought, oh, that sounds pretty easy. So yeah, that I did it last week and we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Well, I guess I, I think we'd all be really interested to hear if uh, if you have some success with that. Um, um Julie, I think there's a great suggestion from Pamela in the chat that uh, at their institution, any author receiving OA APC funding must submit their article to our IR. That seems like such a great clause to add to that award. A really good idea. That's a really great idea. And um, Imba is saying that at UVic, they they talk to folks during submissions to inform them about adding it to the IR too, okay. with their grants. That's great feedback. I like that idea. Okay, I'll move on to the next question, and then um, after that, this is the last the last question I have, and then we'll have sort of an open forum for people to discuss some of their challenges. Um, so, if you have any advice on things that um, related to your successes or challenges in uh, IR implementation, promotion, utilization, uh, you can drop them here. And I really want this to be like an open forum. So if people want to chime in and start discussing, um, you know, if you have a particular challenge you're facing, we can do some collective brainstorming and see if we can help each other out. It's a shy group today. <laughs> What is the grants menu? I'm very curious. Is that just like a list of all the grants that are available at the university? Okay, keep collection structure simple. Have a solid team of folks working on it. Yeah, one of the big challenges in this space is always uh, human resources and having enough people to get things uh, get things done and make sure that folks aren't overwhelmed and uh, everything goes smoothly. Um, in that respect, are there anything? Is there anything that you would like to do at your institution that you haven't had the resources to do? Anyone wants to speak up about that? Leah would like to connect to Chris to, to their IR. That would be wonderful. Have you done it, uh, Leah, have you done any sort of investigation work into seeing if there are any Chris systems that do integrate <laughs> with IRs? um yeah we've looked at this um we definitely have looked at this and the u of a has um as i suspect many institutions have has just kind of a weird environment sorry chris means current research information system so you could think of it as a feed of um current publications from your faculty um and there's different vendors that have um products that uh produce this um, and I think DSpace has um, some integration tools for this. Um, but for us at UVA, it's it's like this weird, um, a little bit um, 
of, a, of an ownership question on campus of who, um, what party on campus was responsible for current research information systems, um, you know, who should be keeping track of that information. And so that's not really been sorted out. So um, there was like a budget element to that. And then in contemplating um, the, pro the prospect of a national repository, um, certainly one of the things that I, I spoke um, to Jeff Harder about when I met with him was, you know, I, I would love to see in my dreams um, something like uh, a current research information system that could, you know, reflect research that's coming from many institutions actually feeding into a national repository and helping us to, you know, instead of us uh, collectively, you know, putting so much effort into running our regional or um, not necessarily regional, our, our sole institutional repositories, um, you know, putting our putting our technical heads together on, you know, how do we, um, how could we leverage a, a Chris like at a national level um, to uh, increase the amount of, of openly accessible works? Um, because I just think we can, we could do so much together in that kind of area. Um, and certainly at the UVA, like we're, we're just, we're, we've just undergone such drastic bu budget cuts that's totally out of the question now, so. That's a good point. Um, I just keep thinking about so um, about Chris systems and how how much manual work goes into updating them and keeping them maintained at the the um, institutional level. So if anyone has any I, has any experience with um, more automated ways to keep Chris systems up to date, that would be really interesting. Uh, I look at faculty publications every week to see what's coming out. Um, but definitely we don't have we don't have a Chris system here at UMB just yet. Um, but it would be really nice to have something that we could pull information from and even do like um, see who's collaborating. Uh, use use a Chris system to look at collaborations across institutions and um, and potentially increase opportunities for people to work together. I think that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, so if anyone has experience with Chris systems too, please speak up. Um, it looks like someone says, uh, advice for other institutions, consider future repository needs. Some systems can be hard to change as the material changes. So I'm assuming um, that has to do with updating information or uh, updating IRs. Um, is there anything in the chat? Oh, I love that idea, Leah. Okay. Um, somebody asked if anybody here, Margaret asked, is anyone here from Scholars Portal? So I don't know if um, they had a specific question to ask or if somebody from Scholars Portal is here. Someone else says we have discussed Chris, but we're not sure the library wants to be the leader in this area. This is a very political conversation. Um, yeah, at UNB, I think it's our Office of Research Services that's leading that. Um, but you know, we have a vested interest in the output as well. So uh, it's good for us to be to have our ear to the ground as well. Um, I was wondering, if Scholars Portal has decided on provincial IR. Okay, there's also a new item in Poll Everywhere. Have clear scope statements for the IR. Also, does anyone want to share theirs in the chat? Does anybody have um, experience writing scope statements uh, that they want to talk about? It's a very shy group um, today. <laughs> I 
Emily, does anyone on use Saskatchewan's okay. guidelines in the chat for anybody who wants to check those out? <laughs> Jasmine says people are continually challenging her scope. Okay. So a mediated deposit comment. We mediate everything. Okay. Um, so does anybody want to, uh, or does anyone here have any sort of specific um, issues they're having with um, either, um, you know, with updating their IRs or getting uptake or like what is, um, what do people think is sort of the most predominant issue in, um, in the utilization of IRs and getting people to use them? I think that's a good, good question. Bilingual metadata decisions are challenging. Yeah. Um, a little bit earlier, uh, Donald would ask, was asking what was the process of determining the scope because um, they're working on one right now and struggling with the process. If anybody can speak to how did you decide on your on your scope statement or, or guidelines? Another question, does anyone have thoughts on including non-academic digitized material in their IR? Does anyone have experience with that? Emily? If there is like one line that we sort of try to draw, so it like we are the repository for research, scholarly and artistic work. So like it's fairly broad. There is OER, there's lots of research stuff. It's pretty large, but we don't have just like, here is a bunch of digitized stuff because we do have like the university archives and a couple other sort of things like that. And so we do, and I mean, that's sort of an ongoing conversation is what the line is between our IR and our archive, because you sort of run into this with like, once you start including gray literature and technical reports or trying to do web archiving, then it starts to overlap with what the archives do. So I think that's an important conversation for <laughs> everyone to have too. But I will say that just like, oh, we digitized this, I don't know, set of photographs or whatever would not go in. Um, digitizing old theses, yes, for sure, um, and other kinds of research material. But again, that's sort of within this research scholarly and artistic work scope that we try to keep. Interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a very multifaceted issue. Um, requires some collaboration with the archives. Uh, has anyone sort of worked with archive? with their university archives uh, to delineate what goes into their respective uh, repositories? Has anyone done that? Okay, let's check the chat. There's kind of a discussion going on now about OER in okay. the repository. Um, so some people saying they don't, but some people do include um, OERs. Um, some people talking about working with the archives. Yeah, I'm interested in the OER um, ideas personally. Like um, Pamela, or sorry, Emily, um, when you include the OER, are you you put the entire resource or like an abstract and link to um, the the resource at another location? So we have a separate like Pressbooks directory for Pressbooks. And this was kind of meant to fill that gap for things that are not existing in Pressbooks. So it's a, it's a separate OER community because they wanted somewhere that they could sort of see it all. And basically they they'd been sort of, the, the folks doing OER had been sort of wanting like a separate database. And this was a way of saying, this is something that we can do now that meets, you know, 80% of your needs kind of a thing, as opposed to waiting until the someday when they can have their own database that does absolutely everything they want. So it's mostly like, um, lecture notes and supplements and things that are not fitting within the context of Pressbooks. And I should add that it's, this is within the last like three months that we've started. So it's not massive and I'm sure that the scope will, will shift as we go, um, but it's not links, it's, it's the actual materials. So yeah, the bigger picture of discovery for OER is not totally covered by this because of the Pressbooks thing. 
Um, and I know that's a real concern for a lot of OER folks. So it's definitely just one piece of how we're trying to address that here. Yeah, that's interesting. Pamela says we're working with archives. Uh, do you want to speak more to what kind of considerations you've had to uh, think about? And, you know, are you coming up with like a joint policy or anything like that? It's a bit new um, and we haven't launched our site yet, but and our, our archivist only started in January. So the, the, the short answer on that is the infrastructure isn't really in place yet, but we have a research chair here who um, is just doing interviews with people and it's more of a heritage uh, perspective. So we'll have some audio interviews and transcripts and things like that. So we're creating like a digital collection within it, but we also hope to have a, a, a portal for faculty research and, and that as well. So we, just to kind of put an asterisk on all of that, we're such a small institution that it's not really a, an overwhelming thing when it comes to content. So we're only dealing with uh, Acadian history and research. So it's it's quite the, the tiny and precise uh, subject matter uh, compared to a bigger university like U, U of Saskatchewan. So um, yeah, infrastructure to be developed as we go. Okay, thank you. I wish you luck. I hope that hope that goes well. Um, yeah, uh, one of the things that sort of prompted this conversation um, was a need from folks at smaller institutions to learn from people who might be more um, who may have more established practices around institutional repositories. So I'm wondering if anybody at a smaller institution um, has any specific concerns about like resourcing or um, resourcing strategy, things like that, that they want to um, maybe bring up or some of the specific issues that they're facing as a small institution. Hi, Elizabeth. Sure. Um, so I asked the I just asked a question in the chat. Something that we've been talking about or considering is whether uh, going forward we would like to have the catalogers more involved in describing the um, the theses as they're being received um, digitally, and whether uh, how how we can go about having catalogers more involved in the IRR work um, as people who have expertise in metadata um, and particularly looking forward to having our um, our IR records showing up in our discovery layer um, and when that's going to happen definitely there's metadata mappings and things that catalogers need to be involved in so I was wondering uh, yeah just what the organizational structure is for other people at small institutions whether um, Skullcom's librarians are doing this work themselves with the deposits or if they're working with their cataloging team or um, yeah just what your workflow might look like. There are a couple of answers in the chat. I don't know if anybody who's answered there wants to elaborate or I can just read out kind of what's um what's there. Um, so Amy says that two staff from the metadata department work on the repository at SMU and some items from the IR go into Primo, um, but a cataloger manages um, the originals in both DSpace and MARC. Um, for the for the theses, it sounds like. Um, I think Emily's hand up was for a sec hand was up for a second. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, only our theses and dissertations end up in our catalog. So like I have consulted catalogers for help making sure that that process doesn't break, but they're not generally involved. Um, and for what it's worth, I it's funny because obviously there's a really wide range, but you know the harvest team is basically me with some input from one li librarian and like occasional other stuff, but it's not like there's a large number of us here working on it either. And so our deposits are mostly self-deposited by people still at this point and are definitely a mixed bag in terms of quality of metadata and description for sure. Um, and we're also down a metadata librarian at the moment. And so some of those bigger picture conversations about like how much cataloger time should be invested in this sort of stuff are sort of in limbo.
Uh, do folks have um, experience with multilingual um, metadata? Like, or I guess with deposits that are multilingual and, and how do you manage the, um, the metadata, I guess would be my question. Anyone has experience with that? Yeah, Pamela. So it's it's been a challenge because we want uh, a bilingual interface, and that's part of the reason that we hired a third party to do this for us, because Islandora comes out of the box one language or another. So having a multilingual site or bilingual in our case uh, required some some uh, te technical support that we don't have. We have about 500 students here. That's how big we're talking. So. Um, definitely needed some support with that so when it came to metadata we're just doing our best to follow the example of existing sites so looking at uh library and archives canada or canadiana and how they describe and how they do things and what fields we may want to translate but it's uh it is uh a bit challenging because the way Islandora works, you you have to it, for us, um, you have to create one language and then translate the entire thing, um, and you have to decide, okay, do I want my subjects to only appear in one language in one interface, or you know, in both languages and in in both interfaces? So, it's been a, a bit of a decision uh, decision making. Um, process to find out, figure out what our searchers might be might be wanting when it came to that. So we we did go very much in line with what others were doing. And uh, I think both LAC and Canadiana were using bilingual subjects, for example. So uh, we in and summaries as well. So we're we're having a lot of translation um, in our when we're creating items. OK. It's a lot of work, I imagine. But definitely worth it. Um, so it looks like people are making connections in the chat. That's great. I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah, does anyone else have any other um, burning questions that they would like some feedback on or some collective brainstorming uh, to happen? No. Oh, Elizabeth and Pamela. Me again. Elizabeth and Pamela. Yes. Okay. So for institutions who might have been part of um, a, coll a collective such as Cairn, which is Islandora that um, many folks out in uh, call are using, um, for people who went their own way earlier, did you have to go through an RFP process on your campus to do things alone? Um, I very much would like to see something national or regional happening again, but if we can't uh, join something either nationally or regionally. I was wondering whether you had had to go through an RFP process um, and procurement because I'm imagining it would be the same as a system implementation. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. That's that's what I had told my dean, but I wanted to see if um, see if that was the case for other people that they had to do an RFP, which is also um, a lot of time and work. <laughs> Thanks for people chiming in in the chat. Um, so Leah's hand is up now and then Pamela. Sorry, sorry, it took me so long. Um, I, I wanted to ask if other folks have, so early in our IR, time which was like 2007 let's call it the call the baby time like 2007 to 2011 we accepted materials that were campus authenticated only materials in our IRR. we just wanted to get some materials into our ir and um then we i think it was like 2000 and 17 or something and I put my policy foot down and we stopped 
accepting any of those materials. And now I'm working to, with different groups to convince them to relocate outside of our IR. And I'm just wondering if anybody else has a similar, like if anybody else is going through a similar process of um, actually working with some content to actually remove it from their repository because it's not open. Um, and if you are, if you, um, if you'd like to contact me um, at the University of Alberta, um, it's just Leah Vader, let's just Leah V at ualberta.ca. I'll throw it in the in the um, in the chat because um, it's it's a tricky conversation, um, and I just I just wanted to like send out a little bat signal to this great community to see if anybody has some strategies for those sorts of conversations because it's kind of a some of the folks that donated or contributed to those materials are long gone from the institution. So I'm, I'm having some really interesting conversations. It's not a huge amount of material, but the promises that we made around the material are like things that we're backing out of. So um, if you're looking at anything like that, I would love to speak with you. Um, yeah, I'll just put my name in the chat. Um, or anyone who might want to talk about that. So thank you for allowing me to ask for help. <laughs> That's all that was. That's what we're here for, it's to help each other out and share information and knowledge. So reach out to Leah if you have any advice or want to connect around that issue. Uh, Pamela? Yeah, thanks. Um, just uh, given the chat, uh, some people were talking about having catalogers work on their IRs. I just kind of I wondered what kind of work they're doing specifically. Like, are they are they using Library of Congress to describe things? Like, uh, how how exactly uh, does that look? Anyone have experience with that that wants to uh, share? I, um, I can nerd out a lot. <laughs> Um, so I Amy here from St. Mary's, so that's okay. Pam. Um yeah, because we have uh two members and one of them is almost full time, um, works on original cataloging with DC. So we do use DC subject headings, he works on authorities. Um, and uh Sherry does a lot of the descriptive work because we do have a lot of institutional memory, um, which is connected with the archives as well as the faculty publications. And we also have a whole um copyright um path as well. Um, so our copyright assistant works in with getting the right rights for the faculty publications and whether or not we need a preprint. Um, and then um, uh, Sherry, um, I think works, Sher Sherry's here if she wants to talk, I can throw on the spot. Um, and Sherry is kind of that that end quality control. Um, but um, it, it, it seems that catalogers have been involved for a long time um, here at SMU um, with the repository. So uh, Sherry, I'll put you on the spot. Sorry. No, it's OK. Um, yeah, I guess for me, um, I work in the, a lot of the faculty articles and uh, the pictures uh, that we have here at St. Mary's and um, some other collections. You know, it just depends on what we're adding. Um, so I do a lot of I, I do all of the metadata uh, description for um, all the areas that I focus on. So, uh, you know, and we do D space, um, or sorry, of course we do D space, but we do like the Dublin core description. So, um, yeah, I do that as part of um, my role here. Um, I just, um, yeah, I don't know what else to ask. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. No worries. Um, are there any more comments or um, questions, comments uh, that anybody wants to share? Seems like there's a lot of lively conversation going on in the chat, so that's great. Um, so helpers of help. Do people find these kinds of conversations helpful? Like if we were to do them again in say six months or or something like that? 
And that is really great. Yeah, I think it's great to have people connect with each other and share information um, and just know who's who the experts are at different institutions really goes a long way. Excellent to make connections. Yeah, just bringing people together is invaluable. Uh, so if there's no more, there are no more comments or questions, I guess we can end the call. Um, we'll look into maybe, yeah, uh, there was a section um, in the RSVP to, uh, to have people uh, put in, give feedback about what they want to talk about, but there wasn't, um, there weren't a lot of responses. So we were just uh, trying to find out what people might want to talk about. Uh, so now that we have an idea of what some of the issues are, I think we could probably do this again with a bit more of a focused lens in maybe six months or so. So with that, I will thank everyone and um, okay, didn't realize it focused the conversation. Yeah, the, that field uh, helps us plan these kinds of roundtables. So if you see that again, definitely, um, definitely put some information there. So it helps us uh, understand what our community needs are. Um, so we'll we'll use this information and maybe schedule another one in a few months so that we can have a more focused conversation. Um, but for our first one, I think this was really great, and I thank you all. So I'll let you let you all have ten minutes back of your day. Okay, have a great day. Thanks.